In this video, we're going to take a look at the characteristics of exponential functions and their graphs. Now, there are two cases to consider. Now, in this first case, we're going to take a look at is where y equals c to the power of x and the c value, our base, is greater than 1. So when we see this, the graph will look something like this. Now, remember that the variable is now in the exponent. So because of that, this increase is very rapid. So for this graph that looks like this, the domain is all real numbers. The range is going to be greater than zero, but notice that it doesn't equal zero because it actually doesn't hit the x-axis. So therefore there are no x-intercepts. There is one y-intercept of zero, one. And then there's also an asymptote, which I'll draw in here, which is right over here. And that asymptote is y equals zero. In case two, the c value is between zero and one. So the graph for this looks something like this. Now, you might be asking why that is. So if you think about it, let's say that c was a half. Then we could actually rewrite this half with a base of two, and this will be two to the power of negative one, so it'd be two to the negative one times x. So remember that when we have a negative x, that is a reflection over the y-axis, and that is why the graph that looked like this, when c was greater than one, is now flipped over the y-axis to become looking like this. Now, for both of them, however, the domain is still all real numbers, the range is still greater than zero, no x-intercepts, one y-intercept is zero, one, and an asymptote again of y equals zero. So in terms of the features, they are identical. The graph is flipped here. Now, if you're looking for the y-intercept, remember that we can plug in x is zero and then figure out whatever the y value is. So in both of these cases, because the exponent is zero, then this value will always be one. Now, it's not to say that we can't shift or translate the graph up and down, and we will do that in another section. So let's take a look at an example. So let's say that I want to graph this um, equation, which is y equals 4 to the x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a table of values. And let's take some negative numbers as well. So we'll just pick one negative number, and then we'll go in order. So 4 to the power of negative 1 will give us 1 fourth. 4 to the power of 0 will give us 1. 4 to the 1 will give us 4. 4 squared is 16. All right, so plotting these numbers on here, we get negative 1. So this would be 2, this is 1. So it's a quarter, very close to the x-axis. And 0 is 1. Oh, I forgot I'm going increasing by 2. So 0 would be 1 over here, 1 and 4, and 2 and 16. So connecting these four points, do draw the arrow that it keeps on going up, and don't stop here at negative 1 at, and a quarter, because it does keep going to the left. So you just have to draw it very close to the x-axis, but try not to touch it. So mine's just, just above. So the domain is all real numbers, the range greater than zero, x-intercepts there are none, we can see that it hits the y-axis at zero, one, and there's one asymptote, y equals zero, which is again, this line over here. All right, let's go into a different type of question. So over here, uh, it says what function of the form Oh, and I didn't write what form it is. Should, should say y equals c to the power of x can be used to describe the graph shown. So we graph one just above that looked like a. So let's take a look at one that looks like b. So we have here y equals c to the x. So I'm going to write that down as my base equation. And we're going to pick a point. It doesn't matter which point you pick. So I'm going to choose this one just to make it a little different. Um, so we have y equals 
5, and our x value is equal to negative 1. So this means that 5 equals to 1 over c. So here we have c is equal to 1 over 5. So therefore, y is equal to 1 fifth to the power of x. Now, I did kind of say that it doesn't matter what value that you choose, but actually it does. Because in this case, if I chose, let's say that I chose 0, 1. We would plug in 1, c to the 0, then c to the 0 would be 1. So actually, this one wouldn't be very helpful. So the points that you choose, don't choose the 0, 1, because that actually, if you can look in both graphs, they actually apply to both of them. And they apply to all the graphs, no matter what the base is. So don't choose 0, 1 as um, a point to plug into your equation. All right, the last thing that we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at exponential growth and decay problems. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to use y equals c to the power of x. So based on our investigations that we've seen, our y is our final amount. Our c value is our growth or decay factor. So that's indicating how your, um, your item is growing. And x is your time. Now, I want you to think of the big idea here, though, because I don't want you just to memorize that that's a factor and that's a time. So I want you to think of the base as how much is present after a certain time interval. And then I want you to think of the exponent as the number of increments or intervals that you take. Okay. So base is how it's growing, or how much is present after a certain amount of time. And exponent is how many times you're actually multiplying um, this c value. Remember, it's c to the power of x. x tells you how many c's you have. All right, before we continue, let's take a look at three definitions. So exponential growth, um, this is, occurs when the rate increases in proportion to the number, meaning in proportion to how much you already have. So in this case, this is where c is greater than zero because we're gonna be increasing. So for example, we'll be doubling or tripling or whatever. So that c value means that we're always going to be multiplying by more and more and more. Exponential decay occurs when the rate decreases in proportion to the number. So in this case, the c value will be less than one. So perhaps um, every day, there's going to be maybe a third of what you had from before. So therefore, as if we multiply lots of one third times one third, you will notice that the y value will get smaller and smaller. And there's one special time that you need to know, and it's called half-life. So half-life is a length of time for a mass to decay to one half of its original mass. In this case, c is going to be a half. So let's take a look at one example here. So we have the half-life of a sample of this compound, which I'm not going to attempt to call it, um, and it's 14 years. So what could be the initial mass um, if we put it into a problem? So when we talk about the initial mass, it's nice to use something that's nice and easy. So you can say that and the mass was one gram, or one kilogram, or one pound, or if you don't want to use units, you can just say one unit, okay? Sometimes you can even say that we have 100% of the material. Uh, what value does the mass um, of this compound approach as time passes? So if we keep decreasing um, this compound, and it keeps decreasing by half, Eventually, there should be none left, right? So as time passes, the mass of the substance decreases to zero units. And this is called an exponential decay. So for example, let's say that we start off with one gram. So we're going to plot a point here. 
at time zero. So after, let's say, because it says the half-life is 14 years. So let's say that we're going to take our time interval in 14-year intervals. So that means every time I count one, it actually means that I'm counting 14 years. And then on the side here, we'll put the mass. Okay. So after one 14-year interval, we started off with one unit. So now we're going to have five units. After another 14 years, another second 14 years, we're going to have half of that. So we have 0.5, so now we have 0.25. And after another 14 year interval, half of 0.25 will be then 0.125. And so on. And you can actually use this graph to keep halving if you like. So getting all of these points, we're gonna connect them all. And actually, we can't have this beginning, so I'm going to erase that. So it only starts at 1. And it's going to go down, like so. Okay. So write the exponential decay model that relates the mass remaining to the time in 14-year intervals. So... The amount of substance that we have is equal to half, because that's how we're decaying, that's our decay factor, and our time is going to be x. So it's important here, however, that we need to identify that x is the number of 14-year intervals so that you don't get mixed up that x is actually every year. Because if you don't write this, actually x will be every year. Now, what I want to do is to extend this a little bit, actually. So what about we want to do it per year? Well, we can say that the mass, I'm actually going to do a little bit of manipulation here. So instead of y, I'm going to say the mass at time t. Our base is still going to be a half. And then now instead of x, I'm going to write time divided by 14. Now, why is it 14? 14 means it's the proportion of the time um, that we have that it decays. So if it's 14 years that has passed, t would be 14. Then for my exponent would then be 1. So after one one section or one interval of 14 years, it'd be half to the power of one, which means that it would decay by a half. If t was 28 years, that means we have two intervals of 14 years. So 28 divided by 14 would be two. So we would multiply half two times. So it'd be half squared, which is half times half, which means that we decay by half for two times, two intervals. So for this one, I am going to write where t is the time in intervals. And this is what I mean by understanding the big idea here. So understand that half is what's happening to the substance and the time, or we should say our exponent, how much time is passing. And because we're talking about 14 year intervals, this fraction here should be the fraction of the time that is occurring um, to decay to a half. All right, last part here, what percent would be left over? Um, after 30 years. So we're going to say m of 30. And now I can use the second equation here. Now we can assume that we started with one unit. So because if we started off with 100%, we could say that that would be 1. So this will be a half times 30 over 14. And you just have to plug this into your calculator. You're going to get 0 0.2264. I recommend four decimal places because when you calculate the percent, this will be 22.64%. All right, so that is how you deal with exponential decay problems. And also you could do the same thing with growth.